I have a visitor of preachers coming in uh, here this morning. He's been preaching for us, did a good job this morning. Looking forward to the second service. But I also have a missionary that came by to visit, and I'd like to give him just a couple minutes to introduce himself and to tell what he's doing in Zambia, and that's Brother Rauch. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's good to be with you this morning. I did not anticipate this, but I appreciate the preacher letting me get up here and, and just introduce me and my wife to you. We are Charles and Maria Rauch. We are uh, veteran missionaries to the country of Zambia. And uh, how many of you pray? Good. Then when you leave today, grab a prayer card, okay? And you don't have to look at my face, but when you see her face, it's enjoyable. Amen. So pray for us, and uh, when, when a missionary says that, he's, he's sincere. We really do depend on God's people praying for us. And uh, we've been in Zambia 26 years. I've been, I've been there 26 years. My wife has been there a little over 20. And so uh, we are a, by the way, brother, we are KJV only, I can tell you that. And I appreciate that about your pastor and about this church. Uh, but we are a, a soul winning, discipling, uh, church planning, preacher training ministry. And that's what we do. That's what we've done for 26 years. My wife has been also involved in other things. Uh, before God brought us together as man and wife, she was involved uh, with uh, children's ministries and uh, uh, not only teaching and preaching in a lot of different independent Baptist uh, ministries, but also starting, uh, she was involved with um, orphanages and battered women and things like that. So it's been a very effective as well. Uh, but today we have uh, 10 churches. Our goal is to go into all nine provinces of Zambia. And that's been our goal for many years. You say, well, preacher, have you made it? No, I wish we had. But we're in about four different provinces right now where we've started churches and, and uh, the Men that are pastoring those churches are national pastors that have been trained, and uh, they've, they've done that now for probably close to 10 years, most of them, the senior men. Uh, we've always taken the attitude that, uh, you know, whether it's building a building or whether it's training a preacher, they got to learn to do it on, the, on their own because I'm not going to live forever. Amen? And uh, so they're, they're doing it on their own. Uh, we communicate with them. And uh, they're propagating churches. We've got two or three churches that have started churches in other countries. I've never seen those churches. I probably never will. But we're thankful that uh, the propagation of the gospel is going forward. And uh, we're just thankful we're traveling up here. We're on furlough, uh, reporting to churches that support us. And we had a couple other pastors saying, you need to run by there and say hi to Brother Sam. So that's what we did yesterday and spent a little time with him. And I, I just want you all to know we're going to continue to pray for you all and for your pastor and his family. And God's got all things in his hands, and it is worth it all. And it's going to be worth it all when we see Jesus. And we praise the Lord for the, this opportunity just to meet you and greet you and ask you to pray for us. Amen. Thank you, preacher. All right, Brother Black, will you come and give us what the Lord's laid on your heart? All right, <clears throat> before I forget, um, I mentioned something in Sunday school about my wife being diagnosed. She, uh, she's okay so far. We've had a good five years since that diagnosis, almost six, I guess. <clears throat> and um, she's just a little under the weather this morning. She woke up in the middle of the night, had some issues. And uh, we've traveled quite a bit these past couple weeks. Brother, you probably know you run into some places where the food is questionable sometimes and you don't want to be offensive. We've been to a few foreign countries here and there, and they put things on your plate, and all you can do is just pray. And uh, primarily you pray, God, just keep this down <laughs> till we get out of earshot of our guests. And uh, <clears throat> so she's not feeling real well this morning. She just couldn't uh, make it, but um, she wishes that she could. I've honestly been struggling a little bit with what to preach I know a little bit about the situation and the circumstances that the church has gone through over the past few months here. <clears throat> and um, my main prayer for the time that I'm here is just simply to be a help and a blessing uh, to not only the church, but to your pastor as well. 
And um, <clears throat> God never orchestrates things by happenstance or by accident. And when a man asks me to come into the pulpit, I take that as a very serious responsibility so that I might say the right things and do the right things. Sometimes it may look like I'm joking around and doing things like that. Maybe some people might even say it's disrespectful, but I try not to be. I try to do what the Lord wants me to do in every pulpit that I preach in. So this morning, I believe the Lord wants me to go in a direction that um, I don't want to necessarily wound anyone in this room, but I want to help you. Uh, turn over to Psalm chapter 49. That's where we're going to start this morning. <clears throat> Psalm chapter 49. Appreciate your attentiveness in Sunday school. And again, if there's something that I said or did that um, <clears throat> maybe you didn't like or didn't understand, please talk to me. Don't get upset with your pastor. Um, just uh, roll with it. Again, is anyone dead, broken, or leaking? If not, it's really not that big of a deal. It truly isn't. <clears throat> I think we as especially Baptists get a little bit um, excited about things that we shouldn't get excited about. Get a little bit stirred up. Uh, we've lost a number of things, I think, over the years, uh, especially having grace one toward another. Um, it's quite unfortunate. <clears throat> Psalm chapter 49. That's not what I'm going to preach on this morning. Psalm 49. <clears throat> and let's go ahead and pray. Now, Father, I do pray God, that your Holy Spirit might abide in this place. I pray even now in the stillness of our hearts, would you examine them so that we might be ready to receive what you have for us today. God, may you take the message and honor yourself through it and help the folks that are here in whatever way they need help. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I have been around this country a few times by God's grace. He's allowed us that privilege to travel quite a bit and, and preach in a goodly number of churches. And I don't say that to brag. It's just something that the Lord has allowed me to be a part of. <clears throat> I have noticed I, I've been saved since uh, October of 1987. So you can do the math. I think it's about almost 32 years that I've been uh, a child of God now. And there's been a number of things that have taken place especially in Baptist churches that I've noticed, uh, even in the short amount of time that I have been saved, that, that honestly scare me just a little bit. When I first got saved, I went to a, um, let, me, let me just back up just a little bit. That word saved, some people don't even know what that word means. So let me just tell you what it means real fast. And if you would just relax with me this, this eh, we're still morning, just relax with me a little bit this morning and just kind of let me uh, settle in here for just a little bit. A number of years ago, I was out hunting over near in Southwest corner of Montana. And uh, you know, how many of you hunt? If you know anything about hunting, sometimes you get out there and you, you lose your mind. Um, I was out in this, it was just a beautiful expanse of Montana and patches of timber and there was snow, about a foot of snow, it had just snowed that evening. <clears throat> and um, I got on this trail of some elk and the problem that, that happened was I saw the elk with my eyeballs. Now when you're a hunter and you see elk with your eyeballs, your brain just kind of dribbles out of your head and you think, you know, I can run them down. I can catch them. And, and so, you know, that's what happened. I was in this little stand of timber. These elk crossed in front of me. There's about 20, 30 head, a couple of big bulls in there. And so, you know, I just, I just went nuts. And so I got in behind them. I got on their tracks and I just put my head down and, and I started just trucking, just trucking it. Well, when an elk trucks it and I truck it, there's a whole lot of difference. So they, they were gaining ground and everything like that. And I just had my head down. I thought, you know, eventually they're going to stop. And I'm going to take one. Not, never thinking in the back of my mind that I have to drag that thing out or that I'm getting further and further away from the truck and the sun is going down. It didn't even cross my mind. So I get out there, one mile goes by, two miles go by, about three miles go by, and then all of a sudden it's like a little light goes on in my head. And I think, hmm, I gotta walk back now to the truck. So I stop and I look around and I realize I have no idea where I'm at. You know, I'm looking for mountain ranges, I'm looking for trees, you know, I always try and watch for things like that as I'm going deeper, deeper in. <clears throat> and this time I didn't even know what direction I was going. So I, I sighted off the sun and I got kind of an idea of where the truck might be. And I noticed what time it was, and you know, in the winter it gets a little darker earlier here, so I, I knew that, hmm, I better hoof it back to the truck fast. 
So I started going back in the direction I thought the truck was and, and uh, kept walking and walking and walking and I came across these tracks of somebody else. And I thought, yes, at least I can follow these tracks out and get to a road and, and uh, you know, maybe build a fire or whatever and, and wait for somebody to drive by. I don't know, about 20 feet into the tracks, I, I was looking at them, I'm thinking, man, those look just like my tracks. <laughs> and they were. I had done a huge circle all the way around and ended up exactly where I had started from in the very beginning. I realized at that point that I was lost and I had no way of finding my way out. I couldn't, I couldn't figure out what direction the truck was. I couldn't see any landmarks. I couldn't get up high enough to, to see any more landmarks. And it was at that point that I realized, you know what, I'm in trouble. I am lost out here. There's a big uh, storm moving in and again, the sun was setting and, and, and if you've done any hunting, you know sometimes your pack is full of all kinds of survival gear. Sometimes it's just a Snickers bar and a squished peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I had a Snickers bar. That's the extent of my uh, survival for the evening. I had one and it wasn't even one of the big ones. It was just a little snack size Snicker bar. <clears throat> and so I began to realize, you know what, I'm not going to get out of here unless someone helps me. It's just not going to happen. So the good Christian man that I was, I panicked. Thought, well, maybe I can, maybe I can try and maybe I can just, uh, the, the number one first rule when you're lost is what? Stop. Quit moving around. Let somebody find you. Just get yourself a little shelter and just ride the night out as best you can. Well, I forgot that one too. So I started off again. I did another big circle, ended up exactly where I was at at the, other, uh, at the last time. And I realized, you know what? I have got to stop. I've got to understand that I am lost and I have no way of getting out of here. <clears throat> About the time I did that, you say, did you pray? Yeah, I did. Nothing miraculous happened except that circle and that other circle. But I was sitting there <clears throat> realizing, you know what, you're in trouble. You're lost. You got a Snickers bar to survive on. You got no, got no matches. It's going to get cold tonight. And all of a sudden off in the distance, I hear this honk. Honk, honk. It was a vehicle horn honking. You want to know what my first thought was? Why are they honking? They're going to scare the elk away. What are they doing? <laughs> really, that was my first thought. Then I realized, oh, those are my friends that are over there a few ridges away. And that was our, that was our planned thing. If we didn't return at a certain time, somebody would just honk the horn on a steady basis about every minute, every five minutes, <clears throat> depending on what time it was. And so I waited, honk, honk, honk. And so I, 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 I kind of sighted a spot and I started walking that direction. And then I'd stop and wait for it, honk, honk. And then I keep walking, honk, and then I keep walking. Finally, it got to this big, this big climb, and up on top, I could see the pickup with its lights on, and I could hear the horn loud, honk, honk. <clears throat> I climbed up that hill, and I got in that truck, and I gotta tell you, that truck was the best place on the planet at that time, because I had anticipated staying out in the wilderness the whole night and eating my little Snickers bar throughout the night. And we had in that truck, we had all kinds of sandwiches and soup and everything like that. And it was a wonderful time. But it took me getting to the point when I was out in that wilderness saying, you know what? I am lost. I need help. I need someone on the outside, some outside influence to help me. And it was at about that time where I heard the horn honk. When I mentioned the word saved, what I mean by that is this. There has to come a point in your life where you realize, I am lost. I have no way of getting to heaven on my own, but by Jesus Christ. I came to that point when I was 20 years old, October 1987. I walked into a church. I sat down right about, uh, right about where, where you're at and uh, listened to a message that I'd never heard before about Jesus Christ dying on the cross for me how he could take care of my sins and wash my sins away in his precious blood. But it took me understanding that I was lost. As I was walking up and getting into that truck, I realized, you know what? I now am safe. I'm saved. I can look at you this morning, and because of what took place, because I trusted Christ as my personal Savior in October of 1987, I now am safe. 
I now am saved. Not because of anything that I did, but because I listened to that horn. I listened to that gospel message and I accepted what that gospel message said, that I have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and trust him and him alone and he would save me from my sins. So when I mentioned the word being saved, that's what essentially it is. And you can imagine in your mind being out in the wilderness and then something coming and uh, allowing you to get into a safe place where you're saved for all eternity. I've been around this country a few times. I've preached in a few churches here and there. <clears throat> and every now and again, I get emails, I get phone calls, I get things like that where uh, the preacher or the evangelist or whoever it is on the other end of the line, they ask me this question. They say, why in the world is the church in such a horrible, horrible shape right now? They gather together and they have these meetings where they talk about the church and what we can do, what programs we can start, and how we can uh, get the church revved up again to, to do what the church is supposed to do and to be a glorious church. Uh, they gather together, preachers do, and they talk and talk and talk and talk, and they say, well, you know, if we just preach harder, maybe if we just do this, or maybe if we bring this into the church, or whatever the case might be, uh, there's always this idea of, 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 of just doing something to help God out in His church. Let me just say this, and you can take it for what it's worth. One of the greatest issues facing our churches today is not sin. You say, no, 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 it's sin, it's got to be sin. It's not. One of the greatest issues facing our churches today is not that lethargy, just that laziness of church. One of the greatest issues facing our churches today is not compromise. Listen, I have never ever seen Christianity in worse shape than I have now because of such compromise, but that's not the greatest issue that's facing our churches today. One of the greatest issues that are facing our churches today is the sheer lack of awe toward God. A-W-E. We no longer have a fear of who God is. We no longer have an absolute awe of the power that God holds we no longer esteem God in a position of holiness and righteousness. We say that we do, but our actions do not say that we do. We no longer hold God in a position where He is absolutely powerful and almighty and omnipotent. We can preach against sin, we can preach against lethargy, we can preach against compromise, but the sheer simple fact is this. If we never come back as a Christian, as a church, if we never come back to the point where God is all and in all, where He is a God from everlasting to everlasting, if we never come back to the fact where there is an absolute dread, an absolute fear of who God is, and an absolute awe of who God is, we will never see sin taken care of. We'll never see lethargy or compromise taken care of. I read this story a number of years ago about a, a guy in the early 1700s. He would get up and he would preach and never once would he mention salvation like I just did. Never once would he mention sin like I just did. Never once would he say, you know what, you're lazy. You need to get out and do something for God. He would never say that. But what he would do in his messages, and they would last from anywhere from two to four hours, what he would do in his messages would be exalt God to his rightful position. He would put God in a position of absolute awe. And it's reported that after two to four hours of him preaching continually on just who God is and how powerful God is and, and the majesty of who God is and what he is, it's reported that people would, would fall prostrate on their face and, and weep and cry and many of them would trust Christ as their Savior. Many of them would get right, and all he was doing was simply putting God in a position where he should rightfully be in our lives. The word honor means a testimony of esteem, any expression of respect or of high estimation by words or actions. You're in Psalm chapter 49 and verse 12. Psalm 49 and verse 12. The Bible says, nevertheless, man being in honor abideth not. He is like the beasts that perish. Now we have several uh, people across our states and across the country that are in positions of honor. Our president is in a position of honor. Our vice president is in a position of honor. We have a governor who is in a position of honor. We have men that are on this earth that are put in positions of honor, and we are to respect those positions, but at the same time God says, nevertheless man being in honor abideth not. It absolutely drives me crazy 
when our young people see somebody going boink, 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 and they honor him. It absolutely drives me nuts when our young people, the things that they honor, are just simply men and not God. I'll go even one step further. It drives me absolutely bonkers when Christians who are saved and are on their way to heaven do not honor God with their life. It's ridiculous. It should be. Listen, man is going to disappear. The men that we honor today, they're going to go away, but God will never go away because he is from everlasting to everlasting God Almighty. The Bible says, nevertheless, man being in honor abideth not. That man that we honor today, he is not going to be around in 30, 40, 50, 100 years from now. This week, men were honored for various things. This week, men were honored for their accomplishments, their great skills, their great knowledge, whatever it might be, they were honored. When it's all said and done, the only one, the only one who is worthy of honor is God Almighty. And until we get to that point, our churches will never be clean. Until we get to that point, our churches will always compromise. Until we get to that point, there will always be a laziness and a lethargy in churches until we get to the point. I've been to a few of those old-fashioned meetings years ago when, and I don't know if you've heard this statement before, but I've been in meetings where the vision blurred, where God moved in so thick And God moved in so heavy that you couldn't see anything. In the book of Numbers, it talks about when the priests ministered and God came in, they could no longer minister because the presence of God was felt so heavy there, they couldn't even breathe. All they could do is simply worship and honor Him. We have lost that desire. We come into churches and all we ever want is just to kind of go through the motions and just, just, just sing our little songs and listen to the preaching and then go home and live our lives. We've lost the desire to have God meet with us. We've lost the desire to have God settle in on a meeting. I mentioned in Sunday school those five weeks of meetings that we had. It took us three weeks just to hear from God. And after those three weeks, we had meetings where, where literally the preacher didn't preach a single word. We sang a few songs and God just settled in. And what did you, what did you say? What did you do? We just laid at his feet. We cried. We wept. We honored him. You say there was no preaching? No, there was no preaching. The whole night. Nobody wanted to go home because God was evident. Couldn't get them to leave because God was all over the place. We don't hear about stuff like that anymore. We don't hear about God moving into a place and nobody leaving and and the community looking at it and going, what is going on at that church? We don't hear about that anymore. i got to tell you, the reason is, is because we've lost our awe of who God is. Turn to Malachi chapter 3 now. We honor men. We exalt men into positions where, honestly, God should be. Malachi chapter 3. I'm going to ask you some pointed questions. Don't answer them out loud, but I want you to answer them and throughout the day ask yourself these questions. This week, how did you individually honor God? Again, honor is a testimony of esteem. It's any expression of respect. Malachi is just before the book of Matthew. Honor is a testimony of esteem. Any expression of respect or of high estimation by words or actions, it means to reverence. So this week, how did you honor God? How did you reverence Him? How in your life, this week, did you bring honor to God? It's a good question. Because if this week you went through your life and you never honored God, how do you expect to live a godly Christian life? What did you do to put God in a high and exalted place that He is worthy of? In Malachi chapter 3, and look at verse 16. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 16. I love this verse. A preacher friend of mine quoted this to me a number of years, well, about two years ago, I guess. I've just been parked on it. Malachi 3 and verse 16. It says, Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. Now, I wonder what they were talking about. Do you think they were gossiping? Probably not. Do you think they were backbiting? Probably not. 
But whatever they were saying here in verse 16, they, they spoke off and one to another. In verse 16, it says, And the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. Do you understand what that verse just said? There is a, there is a book somewhere in heaven right now that God wrote of the conversations of these people that were speaking. They were saying something that got God's attention so much that God hearkened. He, he, he bent down, he condescended, and he, and he listened to their conversations, and he said, listen, we got to write this stuff down. This is good stuff. And somewhere up in heaven, there's a book with what these people said. I want to see that book. I often think, what were they talking about? What was so evident in their conversation that, that God saw fit to write that in a book? I, I don't know because God doesn't show it to us, but I wonder if our conversation could match up to their conversation, what God would do in, in our midst. The first category thing that we see here is that in, in verse 16 of Malachi 3 is then they that feared the Lord. They had a respect for God. They had an awe for God. They knew who God was. And because of that, their conversation followed suit. I guarantee you, if you have an awe of who God is, you won't gossip. You won't cuss. You won't say things that are dishonoring to God. Your conversation will be holy, it will be righteous, it will be just. There'll be no gossip, there'll be no back, backstabbing, there'll be nothing, no slander whatsoever. God took those words that these people said and wrote them down as a book of remembrance. Turn over to Psalm chapter 96. Psalm 96. Let me show you a little bit about who God is here. Psalm chapter 96. If we can get to the point in our lives and in our conversations where we honor God, that means everything that comes out of our mouth is in some way honoring to him. It's, it reveres him. <clears throat> the other day, I was in a church, and uh, it was a good service. It was a really good message. It was one of those messages where God just kind of chose to get involved pretty heavily in the message. And there was a lot of stuff. The Holy Spirit was moving. People were being affected by it. And there was just a lot of stuff going on in that room. The service ended and everybody started filing out into the foyer. And within two minutes time frame, I was standing out in the foyer. Within two minutes time frame, after this that God did here, people were talking about football. People were talking about what they're going to have for lunch. People were talking about just insignificant things. And going from the conversation that we had in the auditorium over here to shifting gears that quickly, what, an, what a stunning thing to see and to hear. I would hope that when we leave church today, the first thing out of your mouth is not about the baseball game or the football game or whatever game is going on today. I would hope that somewhere along the line here, when you leave church, your words, the things that are coming out of your mouth are honoring unto him. And I would hope that throughout your day, the things that you do, the things that you say, how you act, I would hope that they honor and please God. It says in Psalm chapter 96 and verse 6, honor and majesty are before him. That's what's before God right now. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. It says in Psalm 104 and verse 1, you don't need to turn there, but it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, thou art very great. That's how you honor him. You tell him how great he is. You esteem him above all others. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty. Turn over to Revelation chapter 5 now. Revelation chapter 5. I'm going to read a portion of Scripture here. And before I read this portion of Scripture, I want to tell you a little bit of a background on who wrote this. Now, I know a little bit about the depth of the knowledge that you may have of Scripture in this church, and that's good and all. But I'm going to tell you something about Revelation chapter 5 here and about the man that wrote these words. The man that wrote these words was imprisoned on an island. He 
You say, well, that doesn't sound too bad. It would be if you were surrounded by other wicked, vile men, murderers, thieves, all of the list of things that you can think of. The island was not this grand paradise like we think of a deserted desert island with a little palm tree and a little hut. It had nothing to do with that. The people that were on this island were vile, they were wicked, and it was not a pleasant place to be. The man that wrote what I'm going to read here in a minute, his surroundings were by no means luxurious. I don't know exactly what they lived in. Some people say that they lived in dirty huts, and some people say that they had maybe some stone houses and things like that, but it was by no means luxurious. They had no Wi-Fi, they had no TV, they had no beds, they had nothing that was comfortable. His companions were by no means holy and righteous. His living conditions were by no means harmonious. Yet even in that condition... In the worst of the worst condition, with the circumstances that surrounded him, he penned down Revelation chapter 5. Now, I wonder today, in our current circumstance, in our current position, I wonder if, the, if we as individuals could honor God in such a way instead of getting mad at God. Revelation chapter 5 now, look at verse 11. Revelation 5 and verse 11, the Bible says, And I beheld... And I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. He saw this, and he wrote about it. I don't think that he probably would have seen this or written about this had he had a poor attitude. I just have a hunch that had John, who was uh, exiled on this island, gotten mad at God and said, God, this is not the way that it's supposed to be, I, I, I think that we probably wouldn't have gotten these words here from John. In verse 12, it says, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain. He puts God in his rightful position. Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. In verse 13, it says, And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such are as, as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. When was the last time that you went into a business establishment and you said, God, thou art worthy? When is the last time that, that someone that you were talking to you just sprouted out, God, thou art worthy of all honor and glory and majesty and praise. When was the last time that you talked like that? When was the last time that you, as an individual, exalted God in front of a whole group of people? Is not he worthy? Is not he worthy of all of our honor? Is not he worthy of all of our praise? Is not he worthy of all of our awe? In verse 14, it says, And the four beasts said, Amen, and the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. The Bible says that we're to honor the Lord with our substance. So what is our substance? That's our money. That's our vehicles. That's our house. That's our voice. That's our body. That's everything about you we are to honor the Lord with. Everything. No, 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 no. That, that can't possibly. Yeah, you're to honor God with your eyes. You're to honor God with your ears. You're to honor God with your mouth. You're to honor God with your fingers, your hands. Listen, some of you are kind of fading on me here. Somebody doesn't want you to hear this. Because if you get a hold of this, your life will change. What you watch, what you say, how you conduct yourself, what you buy, it will all change. Because now all of a sudden, just a frivolous spending of some money, does that honor God or not? The TV show that you like so much, does it honor God or not? Am I meddling now? I don't like to park in those areas like that where I get real specific, but I gotta tell you, if you hear something on your favorite show that's wrong, and doesn't honor God, it's not worthy of your time. I'll just give you an example of one show that I experienced that, and we have Netflix, we watch every, every, a few things here and there. I'm not saying that, that we don't watch Netflix, that we go through life and boy, we don't, you know, we don't do this, that. We, we do watch Netflix. There was this one show, and I don't even think it was on Netflix now that I think about it, it might have been on something else that I saw. But there was this one show 
and I, I think that it, if I remember correctly, the name of it was hmm, Star Trek Discovery. Something like that. It's a, it's a brand new series that's out. Some of you might know what it is. Some of you might be scared to say, oh, I know what that is. <laughs> but I was watching it, and that kind of stuff, you know, that, that's pretty cool. I mean, I come from the old days where Star Trek, you know, they, beep, beep, they had a little thing, beam me up, Scotty, that kind of stuff, where it was really kind of stupid. And then it's kind of transformed into what it is now. And I'm not even concerned about that. But as I was going along through that series, I watched one show and I thought, mm, okay, this is going to be okay. Two shows, okay, we're doing pretty good. Three shows. And about the fifth show into this season, all of a sudden somebody came out and two guys began to like each other. And it was one of those situations. And I thought, you know what? <sighs> That's evil. So I shut it off. But then God showed me something. In season two, there was a man, or a show number two, there was a man and a woman, not married, but they had themselves a little fling. And I watched that, didn't bother me in the least. It was dishonoring to God, and it didn't bother me. Oh, but what bothered me was these two guys over here. I mean, that's wicked, that's vile. <laughs> but over here, where the man and the woman were not married, they were living in an adulterous relationship. That didn't bother me. So I had to go to God, and I had to say, you know what, God? I'm a mess. I'm not sensitive to your Holy Spirit to look at something like that and have that not affect me. I don't watch that show anymore, period. But for me to go to show number two and not be affected by an inappropriate relationship, and then be affected by this one over here, shows my hypocrisy, and my lack of closeness with God. Listen, I, I remember when God showed that to me, I thought, mm, I have wholly dishonored you in what I've allowed to come in. Is not our body the temple of the Holy Ghost? Talks about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God? and you're not your own? If that's the case, then whatever comes in here, here, mm, here, if it doesn't honor God and he's not pleased with it, then perhaps we should adjust our life so that we reverence him in every aspect. And I'm just gonna tell you this, a switch isn't gonna come on and you're all of a sudden tomorrow gonna be spiritual. The Christian life is, is a very, it's, it's a process. And God will reveal things to you as you kind of go along and he'll, he'll show you certain things. It's at that point when he shows you, you know what, that's wrong, that you need to repent of it and get rid of it. But the Christian life is a process. You will never arrive. Sorry. But you got to know the truth. Because there, there'll be times in your Christian life, I'm completely away from the message now, but I think I need to say this, there'll be times in your Christian life where you're spiritual, at least you think so, and you think that you, will, that you have arrived because you don't do this and you don't do that. And well, I don't do that, but other people do that, so I'm, whew, I'm good. But there, 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 there's always points in your life where God brings you to so that he can get you to the next level. I had a guy in my church in Wyoming who smoked cigarettes. I know in Baptist churches, you don't mention that you smoke cigarettes. It's okay to watch R-rated movies, but bless God, you smoke cigarettes. That's how it is. This guy, he smoked cigarettes, and he came into my office time after time after time after time. He said, Pastor, I can't kick him. He said, I read my Bible, I pray, I can't get rid of it. It just won't go away. He said, what'd you do? I told him he was evil and wicked and vile. No, I didn't. <laughs> I told him, one day, Mike, you're going to get to a point where God will move in and that thing will be gone. And sure enough, I saw it happen. He got to a point, he picked up a cigarette, and he went, Sow! Sow! Somebody put something in my cigarette? Never touched one. 
for the rest of his life. He's in heaven now. But see, God brings us through our Christian life through phases. Now, you should desire to be holy. You should desire to be absolutely 100% clean. But the fact is, you're not going to get there until the day you die. Don't be discouraged. Don't use it as, as an excuse to, well, God hasn't told me that I have to get rid of my cigarettes. <laughs> and don't, don't do that. But just let God work in your life accordingly and honor him with everything that's in you. The Bible says we're to honor him with our mouth. It says, sing forth the honor of his name. Make his praise glorious. We're to, when we speak, we're to honor him. Let thy mouth be filled with thy praise and with thy honor all the day. We're to honor him with our heart, not just lip service. The Bible says in Isaiah 29 and verse 13, Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me. We need to honor God with our mouth. We need to honor God with our heart. Turn over to Revelation chapter 9. You're right, or I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 7. You're right there. <clears throat> if you get to the point where you put God in an exalted position, it will be very difficult for you to sin. The problem today is not pornography. The problem is that we do not fear God. The problem today is not some wicked, vile sin that a preacher will get up here and preach on. It's the fact that we don't honor God. We just don't. We don't have a healthy fear of who he is and what he is. In Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9, it says, After this I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God. Wouldn't it be a blessing to have a church service like that? where everyone in the room fell on their face and in sincerity worshiped and honored God. In Revelation 7 and verse 12, it says, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. How have you honored God this week? When you go home this afternoon and the services are all done, I think services start back up again about two. We will be done, Lord willing, by three might be three in the morning, but it will be three at some point. I'm kidding. But when you leave this auditorium, you go out and you get in your vehicle and you go wherever you're going to go, you do whatever you do this afternoon, are your actions honorable to God? The things that you say, are they honorable to God? Do you understand this idea of Christianity would take care of a lot of the things we deal with? When you speak to your wife, are you honoring her in your speech? When you speak to your parents, are you honoring her and God, or your parents and God in the way that you speak? What a phenomenal idea. I don't want to belabor the point much more, but let's go to Psalm chapter 103. <clears throat> Psalm 103. Let me just read a little bit here, and I think we'll wrap things up. I would love to have God sometime come into a church service sit down and I know he couldn't inhabit the building but you understand his presence could be here the Holy Spirit could be here what a blessing it would be to have him come in and sit down and and as he's listening to the conversation or to the praises that are going up uh, maybe one of his angels or even God himself is writing things down that would be a blessing Psalm 103 the Bible says bless the Lord O my soul and all that is within me bless his holy name imagine us being able to bless God Verse 2 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. He takes very good care of us. Verse 4, Who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. We have a God that we can honor. <laughs> we have a God that we can worship. We have a God that we can exalt, that we can revere. We have a God that is holy, that is pure, and that is right. Listen, I lived in this world a horrible, horrible, wicked life. If you knew the things that I had done before I got saved, and I'm not going to mention a single one, but if you knew the way that I was before I got saved, you would realize that God is in the business of miracles. And sometimes we forget 
that God can do some great things in our lives, and we have a tendency of lowering his honor to where it's not supposed to be. If you just simply look at the people in this room, the ones that have trusted Christ as their Savior, and understand that God did not have to save them. He did not have to save you, but he did. And because he saved you, you now have your name written in the book of life. You have a home in heaven waiting for you. You have a millennial reign. You got all kinds of stuff ahead of you just simply because God was merciful to you. Why he was ever... Listen, there were times in my life, told you I wasn't going to mention this, but this is one. There were times in my life where I would shake my fist at God. i say, God, I hate you. You are worthless. And I'd go on like that. I'd cuss God out. Why he didn't kill me, I have no idea. When I was 20 years old, I walked into church. I heard the gospel about Jesus Christ, how he died for me. I accepted that thing. He washed all my sins away. And I told him... Two days after I trusted him, I said, God, (laughs) I got no idea how merciful you are, but the fact that you saved me, I'm going to give everything I got to you. My life, my being, everything, it's all yours. You do with it what you want. You say, do you regret regret that decision? (laughs) Absolutely not. Absolutely not. He is worth giving our lives unto him wholly. He is worth honoring him. He is worth it. It's all about him. The devil for 20 years beat the snot out of me. Just flat beat me down. I was two weeks, two weeks away from killing myself before I got saved. I had the gun. I had the vehicle. I had the note all written out. And I had the place. I didn't do it by God's grace. What a merciful God we have. What an honor it is to be able to serve him. What a privilege it is to be able to lift up hands unto him and say, God, thou art worthy of all praise and of all honor and of all glory. What a privilege that is. And I hope today that you get something from this little thought that you can take with you and use to honor him. Father, appreciate the opportunity once again to look into your word. I pray, God, that you would take, Lord, this very simple thought, very simple message, and do with it as you see fit. God, it's not about us, it's all about you. May we in some way honor you in our lives, in our hearts, our minds, our speech, all of it. God, please help us with this thought, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Touched on a subject that I've preached to y'all for years. One of the things many of y'all have heard me say is, The most important verse in the Bible is Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. Revelation 4, 11 says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. You know, you were created for God's pleasure. He doesn't owe you anything. He doesn't owe you anything. And you know what one of the most dishonoring things to God is? Dishonor. You want to know what the most dishonoring thing is? You know, what makes people feel dishonored? You go over to the Middle East. They offer you something to eat. You say, no, I don't want that. And that may be the last meal they have in the cupboards. They're trying to take and do something for you ungratefulness is the most dishonoring thing you can do. When you look at what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary, that He died for your sins, took your place, and made a payment for you that He did not have to do simply because He loved you and gave His gift for you, dying in your place to take your sins away, you say, I'm good, I don't need that. That is the most dishonoring thing you can do to God. It's the most dishonoring thing. Have you ever honored God enough to receive His Son as your Savior? He loved you, He died for you, He paid the price for you, all you have to do is receive Him. You cannot honor God until you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. You cannot. It starts there. I want to have a song of invitation.
If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, do so today. You say, all I have to do is come forward and you can show me how to be saved. You can receive Jesus Christ today and be on your way to heaven. And if you've already received Jesus Christ, maybe you haven't honored Him with your life the way you should. You're created to honor God. Your life should be to honor Him. Start today saying, Lord, I'm going to start honoring You with everything in my life. I'll give You the honor You deserve. Let's have a song for the three, nine, four.